Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Virtual Institute for Public Knowledge, IPK, at NYU, and to the third episode of The Shift event series, which will focus on art and activism. Thank you for tuning in. I'd like to also thank our co-sponsors for the series, Knight Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, and Civic Signals. My name is Jessica Coffey, and I'm the Associate Director at IPK. The Shift is our new series that sets out to explore the social implications of the shifts in public life that we are collectively experiencing at the moment. Rather than offering advice at a time when much remains uncertain, we aim to open up a space for sharing experiences and asking important questions. Writer Ocean Vaughn recently said, as a species, it's exhaustion and danger that prompt creativity. That moment of innovating beyond your condition begins with fatigue, exhaustion, and discontent. Yes, I would dare say we have reached that moment. We have surpassed that threshold and we are currently in a unique moment where we are being asked not to gather, but rather to socially distance in order to save lives, a privilege many in our world do not have access to. We are in a unique moment where we are choosing to wear masks, not for theater nor carnival, but again, in order to save lives and to protect one another's physical well being. And so, in this moment, we must investigate how the pandemic is shifting the ways in which we perceive and enact this creativity that Vaughn speaks to. This change for opening up the opportunity for alternative, more just futures. Tonight, our speakers will do just that. To say I am excited for the lineup we have with us tonight would be an understatement. Three of my dear friends and collaborators, Jean Paolo Biocchi, Alicia Gruyon, and Luis Rincon Alba, together with Ernest Bryant, a great artist and thinker whose work I admire from afar, are all here to share their experiences and their questions with us. Moderating tonight will be Jean Paolo Biocchi. But before I introduce him and hand over the mic, I want to thank the IPK team, Zari Lum, Ari Vel Figueroa, and Sam Dijon for their time and energy, as well as a special thanks to Rosa Colon Guerra, who will be live illustrating tonight's conversation. I also want to take a moment to underline IPK's commitment to acknowledging that NYU is located on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples, to acknowledging the Lenape community and to committing to the long process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. I also want to express strong solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and to extend a deep felt thank you to all of the essential workers here in New York and across the globe. Now, our moderator tonight, Jean Paolo Biocchi, is a sociologist and activist interested in questions of politics and culture, critical social theory, and cities. He directs the Urban Democracy Lab at NYU. He has written about and continues to research instances of civic life in both his native Brazil and the US. As one of the founders of the Participatory Budgeting Project, he has worked with the city officials in several US cities and has presented his work to the World Bank, the UNDP, HUD, and to both the world and US social forums. As a quick reminder, please post your questions on Twitter at NYU underscore IPK or on YouTube. And now I pass the mic to Jean Paulo to get us started. Thank you. Please vote and enjoy. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, everyone, the IPK staff, for making this event possible. And I especially appreciate the acknowledgement, so I won't repeat those. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with everyone tonight and to be able to have this conversation that we don't often have, but I think is very vital to have, which is about the role of art 
and to pause and think a little bit about the role of art in this moment uh, and its relationship to activism and to social change. So joining us tonight to have this conversation are three people whose work uh, we admire very much. First, we'll hear from Alisa Grullon. She's an Afro-Taino Afro Caribbean descendant on Lenin Lenape land. Grullon has been featured in a number of group exhibitions, including, but not limited to the eighth floor, Brick House for Arts and Media, School of Visual Arts, El Museo de Barrio. Her activist work led her to be one of the initial and current organizers for the People's Cultural Plan, a collection of artists and cultural workers addressing the inadequacy, inadequacies with the city's first proposed cultural plan. Her most recent project, which we'll hear about tonight a little bit, is called From March to June at Home with Essential Workers, started in her home in the Bronx at the beginning of the COVID-19 quarantine and on view online at the Bronx Museum of the Arts through today, October 23rd. So it sounds like we have a, a little bit of time to go look at it after our conversation today still. Uh, we'll hear also from Luis Rincon Alba. He is a Colombian artist and scholar based in New York City. He has taught in the departments of art and public policy and performance studies at NYU. He's currently a doctoral candidate in performance studies uh, at the aforementioned university. He's an actor, performer, oral narrator, and has collaborated with different artistic collectives in his home country, but also in Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, United States, and Italy. His creative and academic work centers on the performativity of festive and carnival performance, tracing the aesthetic and political genealogy of carnival practices in contemporary literature, performance, art, and music, and how this emergence troubles historical understandings of race, gender, and class. And finally, uh, our third member this evening of the panel is Ernest Bryant III, LPI. He is an artist and critic from the US of A. He has a background in interdisciplinary art. He earned an MFA from Yale University School of Art and a second one in art writing criticism from NYU School of Visual Arts. In his work, he uses nature, video, image making, history, positionality, theory, and humor to examine the ontological conflicts that arise between different aesthetic and cultural values. Currently, Bryant has been developing a method of augmented drawing that he describes as a form of drawing that uses line to explore value, labor, and its displacement. He has received fellowships from his work for the Jerome Foundation, the Bush Foundation, and published the book, Surviving the, the Next Four to Eight Years in the United States of America, 2017 to 2025 for sufferers, sufferers of a recrudescent ideological crisis with a K. And finally, we're also very pleased, uh, I am especially pleased because I uh, so appreciate this art form. We have Rosa Colón Guerra, uh, who's gonna be live illustrating the event. She has been self-publishing comics with her friend Carla Rodriguez for the last 10 years in San Juan, Puerto Rico as Soda Pop Comics. She's been published in The Nib, The Believer, and in the uh, prize-winning anthology, Puerto Rico Strong from Lion Forge, as well as the other uh, Ignatz uh, winning comic called Be Gay, Do Comics. So welcome to you all. Uh, and thank you again for taking the time for all this important, from all your important work to share some thoughts with us. Um, and it's interesting, um, you know, you always, as a, as a social scientist and you read these interesting biographies and you feel like, what have I done with my life that is so boring because my biography just really is so much less interesting. So we're very happy to have all of you with us. So let me begin with a thought uh, and a question. Um, so the thought is um, we, lots of people are talking about the crisis of US democracy and it's a crisis of legitimacy. It's a crisis of many things. This along with a public health crisis the upcoming tenant crisis we're going to have, the housing crisis, the economic crisis, the social crisis, the crisis uh, in white supremacy and in that ideological formation, lots of things are shifting. And one of the crises, one of the crises, and this is what I thought we could begin talking about, to me, is a crisis of representation, which is for the last several months, Hundreds of thousands of people have been on the street uh, all around the United States, all around the world, wanting to have a racial reckoning and wanting to talk about racism and systemic racism and wanting to make the saying that Black Lives Matter meaningful, wanting to end uh, police torture and violence 
uh, immediately. And somehow that, along with many of the other demands, doesn't seem represented. If we look at the election we're about to have uh, in the next few days, and I, I do realize that presidential debates and vice presidential debates are only a tiny portion of all, of all the political process that's going on, but it's almost as if all these demands on the street and of people haven't been heard. They're not represented. They find very little reflection in our formal political system. And when I had the opportunity to look at some of the art, some of the, in the people are calling some of the liberated zones here in, southern, in the south of Manhattan, when I've looked at some of the different graphic novels that people have put out, it seems to me that art is a space to think about these claims, to process these claims, to imagine new possibilities and new worlds. So the, the thought is, is that art opens up a space or can open up a space uh, that is not available uh, in other forms. So my, that was my thought and my, my question to you, and maybe we can start with Alicia, and this is the, the first theme, is what are forms of art that you've seen or that you've been involved in uh, that you find particularly meaningful in terms of uh, the social change that we want? Oh, thanks for that, um, Jean Paolo. I mean, I guess I wanna ask where do you mean that it's not represented or there is a crisis of representation? Like where specifically do you mean? Because as I reflect on the question, I think in my circles, the representation is, is present and the dialogue is present and the questions of how are present. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking with all of you together that perhaps it goes back to who holds the power of mass distribution of representation. Like perhaps it goes back to being able to dismantle the holders of um, the mass scene, the larger distribution more accountable or to break it down. Um, and I'm thinking because I think in, in, in some of our like email back and forths, I, I mentioned that, you know, social media is a great platform for art and I've seen some exciting things. And then when I reflect, I keep in mind that access to social media relies on access to having a cell phone, having a cellular plan, a mobile plan, or having access to some sort of device, which entails having access to the internet, which entails having a bank account, right? So access to information and access to lines of re re um, distribution or representation from that angle are, are severely limited. And then when, when we look at um, television or films, you know, we still have, Hollywood is, is still backwards when it comes to representation of, of people and, and their persistence of othering um, BIPOC people is, is, is still startling in the 21st century, um, but I regress. So I think, you know, I'm just, wondering like where, where is this crisis of, of representation and, or did I mention it or we can all talk about it? I don't know. No, I, I think that's, that's, that's a wonderful way to rephrase that question. I, I think another way to, we could go at it is to think crisis of representation for whom? You know, white supremacy seems to be plenty represented and the dominant racial order seems to be uh, plenty represented. So I, I think, the, I think to ask this question about art and activism and social change in this moment and, and what is, what could be meaningful, maybe the way to, to go at it is as you're suggesting, which is how is art 
distributed? Who holds the power in the distribution? What is the access do people have to the different forms of social media, uh, for example? Ernest or Luis, do you wanna, do you have thoughts on, on this? Ernest, if you wanna, I, I can go if Ernest. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I'm thinking of the, of the word representation and then always like, uh, I, I always force myself to think of, um, of presentation uh, at, at the same time. Um, and then basically, uh, I, I, one of the most exciting uh, works of art, just to follow up on, on that question that I've seen is precisely Alicia's uh, uh, series for the Bronx Museum that is still online that uh, necessarily like poses the question of like the necessity of that representation for like thinking essential workers. Um, but at the same time, I've been like what's been going on with like my personal artistic life in the last few months is that something that it was like marginal, uh, marginal in a good sense. It was something that like, it was part of my life, which uh, uh, has to do with music and like gather with people and like play some music. Somehow now that like uh, digital platforms open a new space is, is becoming with, is, is, is coming back with, a, with like a new force. And it's a new force that uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to the uh, director of like theater, Me Too, uh, Ruben Polendo. And we were like thinking of like the, the, that wonderful text by Anton Arto, wonderful and tra troubling text, uh, essay on the theater and its double, uh, the theater and the play and what happens after the plague and what happens with like encountering. Uh, so I think it's like fascinating to like the most exciting, I, I, I'm not able to like point out, but specific works of art. I, I mentioned Alicia's, uh, there is this photographer, Camila Falquez, who's like taking up digital spaces, but also like putting works in, in public spaces. So I think that something that I've been having in mind is, uh, how we can do both. I, I heard uh, an indigenous uh, woman from Colombia, a, a political leader uh, of the Sierra Nevada Santa Marta saying like, oh, we got to put our fingers online and we also have to put our fin fingers on the soil at the same time. And that's like a double value that we have right now because before COVID we were planning a meeting and a getting together in New York and suddenly it like, you know, it, 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 it got canceled and what happened, it was that we ended up doing the event and meeting uh, and then uh, a group of indigenous women from the Amazon and from the Sierra Nevada, Santa Marta in Colombia, they were surprised. They were like, oh, so we needed this uh, pandemic to start doing these events online. So we could have been doing this for like the last five years and we're not, now we, we don't need 20,000 or $30,000 to go to New York. So I'm, I'm, I'm I'm referring to that as like the necessity to like avoid the, that that uh, the premises of representation, especially in U.S. USA USA politics, in which like politics turns so easily into a reality show, which is like the like the quintessential form of like representation gone bad. Um, so I'm thinking of like presence and how is it that like. Uh, even though in the, mid, in, the, in the midst of this crisis, like presence is, is emerging uh, and thinking of presence not as in opposition to the digital, but as like a new complementarity. Um, yeah. I think those are really wonderful. And I wanna keep a couple of these points alive, this issue of presence. I, I love this phrase of politics as a reality show, but I wanted to turn back to Alicia a little bit. And I, since, um, Luis mentioned your project. I wonder if you might talk a little bit more about it, about this project of essential workers before we move on a little bit. How did you come up with the idea for that and how has that been? I mean, and for audience members who haven't seen it, it's up at bronxmuseum.org. Um, it's through probably 1159 today. Um, and it's a series of, of self-portraits that are still in progress. And the title of it is from March to June, 
um, at home with essential workers. Um, and my, my medium is interdisciplinary, uh, but mostly from the perspective and from the starting point of performance art um, on photography and for video. So I don't often, very rarely do performance art um, live. Uh, my background's also in, in drama as well as in visual arts. So the way that I approach uh, performance art um, and performance, particularly on the on, on image and image-based media comes from the point of storytelling and what can an image, whether it's static or moving, tell us. Um, what kind of stories, what kind of histories pop up in it um, and what questions are we left with? So in the Essential Workers series, I, I perform uh, different essential workers while at home, um, in, in my home. So really exposing, you know, what my home looks like presently um, and exposing that landscape that uh, we often don't have um, access to. Um, it could come from our way of seeing, our way of seeing that we've been taught um, that I feel has a lot of um, grounding, grounding is probably not a good word in this situation, but it's foundations within uh, the colonial gaze, right? And othering and photography in itself being a tool of colonialism, right? Started off as a tool for science, but then inevitably became a tool for um, and of the colonizer, right? In documenting and showing other, right? So we're left with, um, we're often not left with the perspective of, of who is the image taker, right? Um, and that landscape that informs a lot of what um, an image is supposed to allow us to see or question, right? Um, so in the series of work essential workers, being in the middle of a pandemic um, and having access having well, very limited access to, to other human beings for a, a good period of time. Um, my own, my, my social interactions were limited to my, my immediate family, which consists of my two middle-aged school children and, um, and essential workers, right? So when I would go to the supermarket, that would be my social interaction, um, receiving the mail would be my social interaction, seeing delivery people, seeing construction workers, you know, working while, you know, everyone around us was getting sick and dying. Um, and how to, how, to gr how to grapple with that and work through that as a human being um, be became important for me. Um, but also how to tell this story in history, how to, how to be able to tell this, this perspective of history that I was living through um, and, and living through with others, you know, cause all we had were our exchanges, right? Our, our glances of being scared shitless, <laughs> um, most of the time, you know? Um, so the, the series of, of, of photographs is still evolving because it's from March to June, 2021. Um, we're very still much in a pandemic in, in quarantine, you know, um, although in different stages of it and, the world keeps evolving around us. Um, I, I wrote a bit about this also on the Verso blog. It still should be up. Um, it's a Verso blog has a, has a series called Hot City and it, um, and I, I write more because I don't want to take up too much time because I'd like to hear from the other panelists as well and, and the great questions that Jan um, Paolo has. Um, but I, I write a little bit more about that in the Verso, Verso blog, Hot City. Um, about this series of work that I that's up until tonight at the Bronx Museum. Oh, that, that's wonderful, Alicia. And I would, I, if people who haven't seen this, uh, I, I was looking at it earlier. It really is a, a really striking piece of work, and I, I thank you for doing it. And I, I found the Verso blog. I think it was, I think it's still up. It's very interesting. But I wanted to turn it to Ernest for a second because, or 
for now because a lot of the the, the themes that have come up uh, storytelling ways of seeing the colonial gaze thinking critically about presence uh, relate to some of your own work and thinking so as, as you look around what do you see uh, how do you respond to these points or what do you see as exciting kinds of art in this moment I think you're on mute. Uh, a few months back, I was living in, in New York um, prior and during the beginning of the COVID shutdown. And some of the things that come up for me thinking about presence was uh, uh, immediately um, we couldn't engage with other people in the close proximity. But I think there were so many instances where I would get together with people, um, just a few people, one person who lived in my building and another friend of mine um, who didn't live so close, but we would still get together, the three of us or the two of us, and just kind of talk and maintain a kind of social or like a kind of intimate social connection that's not online. And that makes me think about the different instances um, of other ways to be present or even the kind of benefit of not being present in, in, in the moment. And I think about the work of um, uh, Ruth Wolf Riffeld and the typewriting project that she produced, which is similar to um, Eugenio Ditborn's uh, airmail paintings. And both of them um, would, Ruth, the Ruth uh, uh, Riffeld would produce these drawings, um, I, let's call them drawings, via the typewriter and send them to other artists and collaborators um, and create a community in that way. Um, and there were different kind of political restrictions for the two of those people meeting or her in the group of different artists and collaborators meeting that prevented them from meeting. And this project that she began to do was a way to um, still have a conversation in the moment. And with the, uh, Ditborn's um, uh, airmail paintings, kind of talks, he kind of talks about them as drawings and produces a kind of painting, printmaking, drawing object, folds it and sends it in the mail to a, a particular location and a person. Um, and he also maps uh, the, the, um, the location from where he shipped it to where it arrived. And that be those become two points on a map and he draws a line. And that second person also ships it to somebody. And that becomes a third point on the map and it becomes another line. And so the, imagine one of these works getting shipped around different cities in the world 10 or 15 times. And then you have this kind of intersecting um, line that's produced on the map, but also like the kind of immaterial line that's drawn from the actual object moving through space. And that's kind of how he, he, he talks about it. And so like those are instances of like maintaining a kind of presence um, in a situation where it's not necessarily possible. And I also think about like presence, particularly in this moment or in relationship to technology um, and some of the work that I'm, I've been interested in and how like perhaps um, digital communication isn't always the best way to communicate. And I think Ditborn and Riffeld are great examples of that for me. Um, and I kind of say that because, well, I say that because um, like there's so much writing being done and so much uh, criticism being done about how um, online communication or uh, social media has, is being used or co-opted by external nations or like the internal nation to kind of undermine different political movements, et cetera or to just be aware of what citizens are doing. And like, if that is the case, then the post office, the quote unquote snail mail, like yesterday's form of communication, which is like, as people say, on the verge of bankruptcy, is it becomes a really interesting way to then communicate, right? Because it's not being um, monitored in the way that social communication is. And it's another way to be made present 
um, in a small way uh, with a smaller community, but still able to do something or prepare something or have conversations that are kind of outside of the media. And I just think that that is like, um, it's something that's been really important for me and some of the work that I've been doing regarding nature and, you know, taking, taking walks in nature and doing things with rocks and stones and grass, um, which sometimes has an audience of one or two, or I know sometimes there's an audience, but I never meet that audience. And, you know, every so often you walk around and you see different kinds of interventions within nature, like just off of the, uh, off of a nature trail, you know, oh, okay, humans did that, right? Or you look to your right, oh yeah, humans did that. And those are those kinds of interruptions where there's an audience, but there's not the kind of audience that um, functions in the way that social media functions, which is, it's, a, it's its own kind of thing. And I think just those kinds of points of rest are, um, are really important. And unfortunately, but fortunately, COVID presents the, the opportunity to um, rest and rest is important, you know, like, I mean, right now, so many people are thinking about like, yeah, I have Zoom fatigue, right? I have, you know, six to eight hours of Zoom meetings every day. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's a lot, you know, the average person spends, the average, depending on their age, um, the average person, a, a younger person, maybe between like 16 and 30, spends a minimum average of six hours per day on social media. You know, that's a lot of time, six hours a day. That's more than half of a, like an average work day, right? So imagine people spend six hours like swiping through a phone and in a gallery, there's, there've been studies, people spend an average, average of 15 seconds looking at a work of art, 15 seconds and six hours with the phone. I just think about, I mean, I just think about like, what does that then mean when I say like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna make art. What knowing this as a fact, right? This is a, this, there's, there's research about how much time people spend in front of a painting at like the Met or at, at MoMA, you know, and the average is about 15 seconds, right? And, you know, so I just think like a time for rest and a time for, um, like pulling back and not being present may be like a, an opportunity to do something else. There's so many different movements and ideas that happened, you know, at the periphery and later um, are the things that we look at in museums and in magazines and we read about, we read about them and we have to read about them. Um, and those things happened not amongst like millions and millions and millions of people looking at once, they happened you know, with a group of five to eight people, you know, it's like a, like a thesis, you know, maybe there's eight or 10 people that read it, you know, <laughs> I mean, like that really can read it, you know, maybe not like my stuff isn't, doesn't have that, that, that too, but I mean, there's, you know, you know, like, you know, you have your colleagues, right? I have the people that I can talk to about my work and that's a small group of people, you know, that I can really have that kind of discursive conversation about my work. And that's a small group. And then, you know, as it unfolds out to more and more people, the conversation is a different type of conversation. And there are aspects that people can pick up on and speak to and that, that resonate with them, but those may not necessarily be my concerns. Those conversations are interesting and they fuel me, but they may not be the conversations that I have with my intimate core, like my cohort. So those like thinking about presence, those are interesting, you know, interesting, like I only want to use the word alternative, but those, those are just the things that I was able to do um, during COVID in New York. I'm not there now, but uh, I was there, you know, for the bulk of it and for the, um, uh, for the curfew and after the curfew and, you know, still hanging out with these same three to four people. And those are the, you know, and they didn't hang out with anybody else. So it was just us. So that's kind of how I... Oh. Very nice. And so we're, we're now to, to help uh, Rosa, we are now talking about the, uh, Ernest very helpfully pivoted us to the question of spaces for meaningful art. And as you were criticizing social media, I noticed that Luis was uh, nodding very vigorously. So I, I thought we could turn it over to him. What do you, what do you say on these questions, Luis? Um, well, I, 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 before moving to that, because I, um, no, actually, this, this, 
necessity because as a I start like articulating the idea, but then I drop it of like, you know, having this understanding that there are ways of communication that uh, as Ernest was saying, that maybe the digital and some other forms that are like super fast, they are not as reliable and, and somehow this necessity of rest and this necessity of slowing down um, was uh, fascinating and also a terri ter terrifying kind of experience at the beginning of the of the pandemic. Uh, this idea of a slowing down that like at the beginning when it's not that things are like more clear right now, but at the beginning, like for example, for me, I couldn't for the first first few months, I couldn't sit down and read more than page and a half. It was impossible because like somehow the, the the necessity, especially when the curfew began, that specific moment in early June when the curfew began that like somehow like in, in intensified the necessity to like get together with a bunch of people in the cases of like rallies and marches, but also in the case of like the people that like that, that you want to be with. And in my case was like getting together with a few friends and play Cuban rumba and Colombian bullerengue and like getting a small group, but like making sure, but at the same time, the slowing down forced me to not only see how we were like reacting um, to the moment, but also to works of art that were produced before that were like somehow, as I, as I like to think about that, or, like, you know, like um, uh, apocalyptic forms of art. So in my case, I spent, I couldn't read, but I spent most of my time walking and biking while listening to Octavia Butler's novels, uh, a bunch of them. Uh, and, and then that necessity of like somehow slowing down and like, 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 like having the clarity of, okay, this seems to be like a new situation, but at the same time, um, the, 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 the sort of that, that vulnerable position in which like the, 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 the pandemic and the economic crisis intensified for so many communities, uh, made me think of like my past, where I come from growing up in Colombia. I remember my mom saying and, and telling me, it's like, come on, you grew up in apocalypse. Why are you scared right now? Why are you afraid? Why are you worried? It's like, if, if like we have, we have incredible tools because like we've been working on like, kind of like in the apocalypse for, for a long time. And that's something that emerges in like Octavia Butler kind of like, um, you know, like the, when things, when things fall apart, when things don't work anymore, nothing works anymore. And, and what is it that like, like can happen in that moment? Um, and then my, my nodding in with, with social media and these other platforms um, is that, you know, um, uh, as I, I keep coming back to what uh, indigenous leader Fanny Quiru said about like, okay, we got to put our hands on the soil, but we also need to learn about how we could like creatively and like uh, we could take advantage of like the digital, digital platforms. And I truly have no um, answers for that. But what I know is that I have been participating in a bunch of events that if we had to like, spend money to bring the people together and sit them together, especially I'm, I'm talking about uh, networking for uh, activist organizations in Colombia, that, that would have been possible at all for security concerns, for uh, budget concerns, for so many reasons. And now we're doing it, uh, we're doing it. So like there is this slowdown in some, in some ways that is the slow one, the slowdown of like, we need to take care. Uh, and, and that's what like reminds me what Ernest is saying about the, the group of four, pe four people that, that he was talking uh, and having close communication with. Uh, but yeah, the this, this, this slowing down in, on, on one hand, but also the possibility of like reconnecting in other levels for other purposes. And, 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 I, and I'm really fascinated by the, by the potentiality of that. 
Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a striking feature. You were talking about the Colombian activists. One of the, the things that's been striking in the sort of the Brazilian diaspora now and this defend, trying to defend democracy in that country is that um, in some ways people have gotten a lot closer together and are working a lot more intimately from their kitchens all over the place. So yeah, for sure, that's interesting. Alicia, do you, do you have any thoughts on this question? You're the one who brought up social media in the, in the first place. What, what, what particular question? I mean, I have a lot of thoughts. I've been writing non, nonstop. So, um, I mean, a few things come up in regards to, you know, in, in regards to what Ernest said and, and how slowing down is actually it's become a ca counterinsurgency, you know. Um, we're under increased surveillance in social media. Um, so how are we using it in order to bring people who would otherwise need to spend five digits to get to a place to converge and to meet with others? Um, where you know social media and zoom here we are like we're providing a platform to continue these conversations but then at the same time there is increased surveillance of 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 what's what's being shared in social media you know you have flagged posts on ig uh for in, in various deg various degrees and some posts that are uh violent in, in, in the sense of, of the messages that they're communicating, particularly when we look at the far right, um, that aren't um, as readily flagged. So, um, I mean, those are a few like popcorn things that are coming up in my mind right now. Um, and then going back again to Ernest said that 15 second attention span, right? When, when we look at art or we look at film, I mean, it's under this capitalistic structure, right? So art and, and film or video or photography, what have you, it's, it's entertainment, right? The purpose it's made is for entertainment and profit. Um, so I get frustrated. I want people to slow down and to spend time and to look, and, and that's a hard thing to do. Um, to ask people to slow down, especially like if you're working with some sort of moving image in a gallery and it's not changing every, every like two seconds, you know, it, it's really hard to get people to slow down. But I, I think that um, it would be in our best interest, interest to do so um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, I mean, those are just a few things in my notes that, well, I, that I have. <laughs> And then like, what's the difference between presence and representation? That's just like something that I wrote down that it would be great to hear other people, uh, other panelists' I, viewpoint on that. Um, yeah, just... let's work on this presence representation, but I'm definitely taking one of your phrases and I'm gonna make a t-shirt that says slowing down is the counterinsurgency, Alicia. I think it's actually mm -hmm. it's one of the things I'm taking away already from tonight's conversation, which is wonderful. I want to, so Luis and Ernest, do you want to talk about this uh, presence and representation uh, relationship or dynamic a little more? Then I want to pivot to uh, a couple of the more polemic questions I had sent you as well. Is it, um, what, let me just kind of get clarification. When you say presence and representation, is it like um, politics of representation or like I'm not represented in this or that section of the society, this kind of criticism, or is it something else? That's up to you, Ernest. All right, all right, all right. Um, hmm. 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 I mean, I, I, I think about like, regarding like politics and representation, I, like that's something that is uh, often on my mind these days and often um, even when I don't want it to be. Um, but I think about like, you know, again, like, um, Sometimes it's like a good to not be present. And like to kind of further expound on that, I have like a couple examples. Um, I can remember the name of the essay, but there's an essay that uh, is criticizing or it's critical of um, the algorithms that uh, perform the facial recognition. It's crit critical of the software 
that functions along with the digital cameras to recognize faces and then um, do this or that with the data. Um, and so much of the criticism uh, says like, oh, you know, because uh, this uh, algorithm is written by this particular group, this particular person who has this particular mode of being in the world, it doesn't recognize these groups of people because their faces are, are different. And so many of the essays, I guess, I get more specific. It's like, okay, these algorithms are written, written by um, young white men and they don't recognize faces of color. They often misgender or um, identify a person as criminal when they're not. And so I just have been thinking about that and thinking about that um, and thinking about like, okay, that's an instance, right? When it's important to not desire to be present, right? To not desire to participate, right? In those moments, it's like um, before you could walk down the street and um, people are not paying attention to you, right? After certain types of conversation or the media um, and the society is in a, having a particular type of conversation, then everybody greets you, right? In the street. And then you can no longer have that peaceful kind of walk and you have to go further and further into the countryside to the periphery. And uh, what, I, it makes me think of like the different acts that you can no longer do when everybody recognizes, recognizes you. You know, like talk to any um, celebrity and they often say like, oh, I wish I was, you know, I wish I was not famous or I wish I just had the wealth and not the fame, you know. Or I wish I had so much wealth that you didn't know who I was if I wanted to sit next to you on the subway. You know, that level of, of um, wealth with no online presence. And I just keep thinking about those, like sometimes it's good to not be known. You know, sometimes it's good to not always desire presence and always desire participation because participation doesn't always mean something good. You know, it, it doesn't always mean something beneficial. Um, for you, and I, it makes me think of this um, other way of participation or kind of politics of representation is a friend of mine shared with me um, this DJ named DJ Afro Amigo. Um, and we were having a conversation about the politics of representation and like black people, women, et cetera, in film and not being present in film. And uh, he shared with me this video and in the video, this uh, artist, musician, DJ takes films that are not translated. He's a Kenyan uh, filmmaker, artist. He takes films from everywhere in the world, films that are popular. Um, and the one that I saw was, uh, I want to say it's Enter the Dragon. Uh, I'm not sure, but Bruce Lee was in it. Uh, and he says, okay, so this is what this guy does. He takes the film, he watches the film, and then he watches the film a second time and creates a dialogue. Right? Not knowing what the characters are saying, but it just works off of the image. So he recreates his own story about these different characters and overdubs his voice for the different characters to produce a narrative that uh, other Kenyans in Kiswahili can now engage with and can now like one with the audio and the kind of like co-expressibility of hearing Kiswahili along with seeing Bruce Lee like pop, 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 you know, punch somebody. It, has the potential to draw people in. And so one of the things she said about this casually, like, oh yeah, that's something we all watch. And I was like floored, like, are you serious? This is that ubiquitous? This was that ubiquitous for you growing up as a teen? He said, well, yeah, you know, this guy's super fan. And then he, you know, he shared with me the videos. And I think that's an instance where um, the kind of physical, um, or the kind of um, mimetic representation of a person isn't necessarily present in popular media. It, uh, just for this example, like thinking about film, but uh, the person is able to participate in a way that may be even more heightened and more intimate than if um, the character or the figure was a person who looked like, just on the surface, looked like them. And so I think those kinds of instances are really interesting because it does two things. One, it just says like, okay, yeah, anybody can read any text 
or look at any film and map themselves onto the character and participate as the protagonist or the antagonist and cheer and, you know, like look at a film and say, yeah, like this is the good guy, or, this is the good good girl, the heroine, you know, and I like this particular character. I identify with this character and that character doesn't have to look like me, you know? So I just think like there are other options and there are other ways to like engage with film, with media, with art, with image, um, and not necessarily like uh, answer the call to be represented because sometimes that representation isn't always good. You know, there's so many films that come out and people are like, oh, that was garbage or that was trash or that made us look so bad. You know, that made this person, that person presented them in the negative light. And what if it was a kind of DJ uh, Afro Amigo presentation of the film where he's presenting a Kenyan narrative with Kenyan values or in Kiswahili and people can identify with and still participate in the blockbuster image of a Hollywood film with big explosions and people fighting and crashing planes into buildings and all of that drama with something that's very, very intimate. And so there's the kind of rupture, but then there's also the rejoining together with the audio and the video. Um, so those kind of, that's, uh, when thinking about that question, those are like examples um, that I think about regarding like ideas of politics of representation and a desire or answering a call to be present or even just having a, a desire or an intense desire. Like I should be there, I need to be there. It's like, well, maybe that's not the place to be. Maybe you don't wanna be that person, you know? Maybe that person is like utterly despicable. Maybe you don't wanna find yourself in certain individuals. Maybe it's good for, you, for one to just find themselves alone with a group of like-minded individuals that have, some shared values, you know, and people may or may not come along and check that out like years later, you know, if they do, cool. If they don't, like they don't, but you know, those people amongst that group of like-minded individuals get to have a conversation kind of in the, in the kind of comfort, you know, without the kind of frisson of being like a, a kernel of pepper in like a sea of salt, you know, or, or a grain of salt in, kernels and kernels and kernels of peppercorns, you know, there's that kind of like, you know, that kind of um, way of standing out and being, um, you know, kind of anachronistic of placing yourself in some some place where other people aren't and it doesn't always benefit, you know, it doesn't always benefit the person. Thank you, Ernest. I think though that's actually a really important set of critical points that you bring up. And I think one, one, we're gonna turn to this in a second, but I, I think about having a critical stance too towards dominant modes of multiculturalism and a kind of watered down version of inclusion, which I know we wanna talk about, Luis, but do you, do you wanna get in on this presence representation? Yeah, that's uh, following up to just your, your comment, Gia Paolo. Um, I always think of the, in these questions of like representation and presentation, especially representation in the work of uh, Afro-Brazilian uh, mm. critic and, and, and thinker and you know, artist, Denise Ferreira da Silva, because like precisely it's like, how is it that, um, the, the problem with representation is like, and I was having a conversation with Alicia, a personal conversation last week about that. And, 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 and just saying it's like the problem with representation is precisely what Ernest is, is, is mentioning. And, and it has to do, and I think it offers like an incredible place to like uh, critically think about art because I think a lot of people are still thinking that art per se is good. And, and we don't think that much. And for example, uh, Alicia's work has been, and, and activism has been incredibly important in New York for like thinking the, the role of artistic institutions in co-opting, uh, in gentrifying, in co-opting, in, and then, and so the thing of, of representation as Ernest was saying is precisely that it's like, it, it, it reduces everything into, oh, we gotta make it to the museums. But the problem is that the fucking museums, they don't have, still they're not able to present ourselves. The only thing that we can do there is represent our, ourselves. And obviously representations are always gonna be um, uh, partial. Sometimes the fact that they are partial or incomplete as the Cuban poet uh, uh, Lesama Lima would say is, is the beauty of it. But most of the time it's not. And most of the time then we end up playing for 
you know, we're the diversity card for, for these institutions that are playing this idea of like, oh, now we, the, the, the dangers as, as Denise, Denise would say in her, in her work of multiculturalism of the 1980s and 1990s multicultural ideas. Uh, so I think it's like, it's just like in, incredibly important to like think of like presence, absence as, as, as Ernest, er, Ernest was saying, uh, and, and it's, you know, be really conscious of the fact that like, like uh, most of artistic platforms, they're not, I mean, if we go and check the money where the money is coming from, mm -hmm. most of the time we're gonna be really disappointed, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I think it's, it's, extremely, it's extremely important to like, uh, to, to keep that in mind, because I feel like there is a still a general sense, not among artists, but among like the, 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 the general public that, that something, because it is artistic, it is good and it's, it's going to bring some good. And it's like when we look closely at, the, at, the, at the, 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 our history, ah, it's very fucked up, you know, it's very fucked up. So sometimes I'm like, why are we putting so much trust? You know, how are we, how are we trusting art so much and some artistic institutions so much? Um, so that's, that's sort of like my, my thinking because uh, it has to do, I, I don't think it, it can like the, the idea of like the politics of representation and aesthetics, uh, they, can, they cannot be detached in this, in, in, in this, in this moment from each other. Uh, it's, it's incredible, it's, it's impossible. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the thought that I have from, um, you know, the, the, the idea of presentation and, and representation and like somehow like avoiding uh, in some levels, mute, we, we could think of mutual aid as some kind of like politics that avoids that idea of representation and like the people just get together and present and gather and say, hey, what is it that you need? You know, I don't have this, I need this. What is it that you need? So, yeah, but, but just pre thinking of like, you know, like the necessity of like, rethinking that, 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 that because something is artistic, it is good. Well, so, so we have a couple of really important ideas on the table and I wanna shift a little bit to give Rosa a heads up. We're gonna talk about anti-racism and I would welcome, I would encourage people to uh, put questions up on YouTube or uh, via Twitter for us, for the panelists to be able to answer. So Luis, Ernest and Alicia in different ways have uh, put up a, a number of really important critical ideas. Um, so Luis was saying, look, this assumption that art is good is something that needs to be questioned. Ernest was saying, you know, again, to go back to Denise Tejeda's um, uh, work, one of the limits of the framework of representation is that there's this image almost of like, a container that needs to be filled with the right kind of multicultural content so that you have, you know, a tapestry. Uh, but there is never a uh, talk of why is this container this shape and why is there only one and, and so forth, right? So there's a kind of liberal fiction and the very language of representation is kind of like a transparent process. Uh, and Alicia was at the very beginning of our conversation was sort of pushing in that direction too. So I wanted to turn to the question of art and anti-racism. And I'm just gonna call on you, Ernest, and then we can go to Alicia next. When we were having this discussion about anti-racism, you said something very interesting on the email exchange, which was it's important to develop a critical stance towards a kind of top-down or appropriate version of what anti-racism is, you know, and it doesn't take a cultural critic to be sort of surprised that all the institutions and corporations are now all solidaristic to Black Lives Matter. Um, so do you wanna expand on that a little more, Ernest, or? Sorry, you're on mute. It's the phrase of the year, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, um, hmm. I mean, um, yeah, I was in, I mean, I was in New York when um, it was COVID and then the um, protests were happening regarding BLM. Um, I'm 
originally from Minnesota, so that was definitely like on my radar. Um, and I, you know, I watched it and I, it was interesting. I kind of like, okay, something is happening. What exactly is happening? You know, there's some like calls for my participation and um, like calls that it's necessary for me to participate. Um, and so I, you know, I like, I was really checking it out and how I kind of come to like some of the ideas that I've been talking about and trying to um, remain critical and really try to investigate and find out like, okay, where do I fit in here? You know, like, where is it, you know, is this my gesture or is this like another gesture? You know, is this another kind of um, discursive shift, right? Um, and I, I keep, um, I still kind of think about it. I think there are moments when it's like, okay, that's a moment where I could actually say something or do something and it actually may get traction, you know? And that thing that I'm saying or doing just so happens to be something that I've already been saying and doing, you know? And that um, came up like, you know, after the election of uh, 2016, um, you know, there was so much like conversations about, oh no, what are we going to do? We got to do something. We got to participate. We got it. The world is going to change. And our, our, your art is going to have to change was something that was said. And that just kind of hit me in the chest. And I was like, what do you mean my art's going to have to change? My art may not have to change, you know? Yeah, but you know, it's, there's going to be so much more racism and people are going to have to, like the people with DACA are no longer going to have it. And I said, well, the people who are in that situation have always been in that situation. They always know that they have a precarious existence in America, you know, and people who, whose work um, was already dealing with particular social issues, you know, who are already being active, active or doing some kind of tertiary relationship with activism through their artwork, they're already doing that. So why would their work necessarily need to change. And so I keep thinking about that when um, the kind of entire conversation shifts or when there's demands or, you know, all of a sudden you see BLM signs everywhere. And it's like, really, you support that? You know, like not even to get into like what BLM is, but now you cannot not support it. You must support it, you know, and even like the, the um, beauty of the phrase is you can't speak against that, you know? It's a, it's a great kind of turn of phrase to put these things together. It's like, well, why would you wanna speak against that? You know, you have to, like, if you wanna be critical, you have to enter in a so much more oblique direction. Um, you can't just say, no, I mean, you know, you say like, wait, if you have a question about that, then he would say, wait, black lives don't matter. And then you're kind of handcuffed, you know? And so I, I just keep thinking about that and like, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean when um, Nike or Adidas or like pretty much 50 to 80% of the different businesses like within New York, when they begin to reopen had BLM signs up. And it's like, well, wait a second, you know, is this a discursive shift, you know? Like the kind of, um, this, I just recently read this piece by uh, Glenn Coulthard um, and it's a uh, red skin, white masks. And it's a kind of talking off of uh, Fanon and he talks about a particular shift, right? And I'm describing it as a, as a discursive shift. And he talks about like, okay, um, 19th and 20th century settler colonialism engage with the indigenous people of Canada and the Americas in this way, like the kind of overt violence, right? The kind of raping, pillaging, murdering, like you've seen, I'm sure like different etchings where they're ripping kids in half, you know, this kind of like overt violence when you think of what's the relationship of uh, settlers to the, to the Americas. And it's that thing, you know, like Das Casas is explaining this stuff. And then there's a shift, right? And he begins to peg the shift um, on the 1969 white paper in Canada, which is a kind of inclusionary um, legal document, which says like, okay, before there was the Indian Act, which says like, okay, you're an Indian, you're an indigenous person, you are separate from uh, what will then later become Canada. That's, you're something else, right? You have, we have treaties with you, we have other ways of engaging with you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but you are not this, right? And then there's these different shifts, right? Okay, later, you know, yes, you are also like, a, 
Canadian or you're also an American, but these, he speaks about these as different ways to further erode the being or the identity of the indigenous person, right? And so I keep thinking about like, uh, like, okay, let me think about this, right? What is this like gesture, which all of a sudden has included me in all of these different ways, like economically, right? It's included me in, you know, or included people in ways um, that happens through like media, through like so much advertisement. I mean, really brilliant advertising stuff. This stuff really like is impactful. And it just made me think about, I don't remember which year, but it was the Super Bowl. And there is a speech um, by Martin Luther King. It's uh, his famous speech. I have a dream speech, but a different section of it. And in that section, uh, he's speaking about people who have a particular voice that resonates with the masses of people being co-opted, right? By the state or by this or that, right? And his voice was the background audio for a truck commercial that played during the Super Bowl, right? And the audio, he's actually criticizing this as something that is not necessarily a good thing, like being used for capital or for the generation of capital, right? And I just, like when I saw that, I just thought like, wow, you know, this is a Super Bowl. This is like a um, opportunity for like the top design firms to run their commercials. And it's almost like a visual competition, right? And to see this happening, I just think like, hmm, if that can, if that, the way his voice resonates and the work that he does can then be um, incorporated to sell trucks, right? Not to liberate people. It's now selling trucks, right? If that can be used in that way, then it's like, hmm, it just makes me think about when these images pop up or when, sorry, my screen, or when um, I go into coffee shops and there's a BLM sign, you know? It's like, hey, wait, well, so wait, you didn't support that the other day? Or, you know, in other instances, when there are people who, you know, on their social media, like everything that comes up, it's like, yeah, I'm on that, I'm on that movement, I'm a part of it, I'm making posts and I'm getting likes. And it's like, hey, wait a second, you know, I've been in close proximity to you in conversation and you never cared about that stuff, you know, you, or you never displayed a care about that. And some of that can be like, um, okay, maybe now there's a political will to do certain things, you know, and that's like a kind of generous read, but the kind of capital C cynic in me says like, ah, maybe, you know, it's a, uh, it's a way to, you know, steal function in the society. You know, if we think about like um, empire willing to do anything and everything to reproduce itself, even ally itself with a marginalized group, person, image, identity, et cetera, so long as it is able to reproduce itself, it's doing the job and the work that it needs to do, right? So if I need to put a if I'm empire, I need to put a black face mask on in order to continue or re continue reproducing empire, then I would do that, you know? And so I just think about different instances and I don't wanna say like a blanket statement, like every instance I see BLM, I think some people are really genuine, you know, but I think it's also like, it's important for people when they encounter or enter different spaces and there are these signs and there are all these calls and all of a sudden now everybody cares. It's like, really? Do people care about those things? Why, why aren't they doing these kind of like material? When do the material conditions of my life then begin to change? If there's, all, all, if there's this kind of um, erratic experience of like political will, you know, not necessarily political, of a kind of will or way of thinking about this. It's like, okay, well, when do the material conditions change? You know. When are schools like really teaching students the things that they need to know, you know? And now I'm in academia and these things are coming up and presidents of universities are saying things like um, decolonization is where the money is. And I say, yes, rightfully so. That is where the money is, you know, that is where it is. And even to like take a quote from Fernand, he also predicted this particular statement when talking about uh, how the settler colonialist deals with the natives when there are different uprisings, there are calls for a quote, quick, 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 let's decolonize, right? So the Congo doesn't become Algeria, like close quote. This is his statement, right? And it's 
this particular type of call when thinking about how empire is able to function. And, you know, it's not this kind of fixed thing. It's not this kind of brutal violence. You know, sometimes it's discrete violence. You know, there are other ways to, to get things done other than just bashing a person upside the head. You know, there's so many other ways to do it. And I just keep thinking about that, you know, and it allows me to like try to maintain like a kind of critical stance or not to just jump on the bandwagon of something that like, oh yeah, I gotta do something. Yeah, let me do it. And it's like, well, maybe not, you know, I already talked about that like 15 years ago. Why should I spend all my mental energy like focusing on it now because it happens to be like the thing that resonates most in the zeitgeist? Maybe not, maybe I'll go for a walk in the woods with my close friends and move stones around, you know, because that may be an opportunity to rest, you know, for people who have been participating at such a high level or constantly fighting this thing or trying to do something through their work or through their um, scholar, scholarly research or whatever it is they do in life, they have this, they also have this concern. Maybe it's like an opportunity to rest because like, hey, look, everybody else is doing something or this other group is doing something. And when I see things on TV and I see, you know, the makeup of the crowds, I've attended one march that passed by my house and just thinking about the makeup of the crowd, you know, it's like, oh, okay, this is interesting. You know, this is cool. Like I can, you know, I can watch people do something and see how it plays out. Maybe I don't always need to like stick my tongue in there. Like I can sit back and take a break and read some text, you know, and write and think about what it is that I want to do. So I kind of think about it in, in, in that way and try to like engage with ideas of anti-racism, maybe in a more like anti-racist way, like A-N-T-E racist way, which is the kind of uh, state of being before like a racism. You know, and that's like, huh, that's kind of weird. It's kind of provocative, but it's like, huh, that's something to think about. You know, it's something to think about when engaging the term anti-racism. It's like, okay, you're responding to racism. So now you're in the discourse with the thing that is racism. You're part of the discourse. You know, you may not be the orthodox position, but you're the heterodox position, right? And the center determines the periphery. So in that kind of like theoretical relationship, anti-racism in some instances can be just a kind of participation, like playing a, a game of ping pong or a game of tennis, you know, and it might be uh, more interesting or more productive to take an anti-A-N-T-E racist stance, which is to attempt to participate in the world without um, constantly engaging in a particular way of being and thinking, which is a response to something that has potentially been done or will be done to your being. Oh, very nice, Ernest. And a couple of, of things, you know, to keep alive this thread of a critical relationship to representation. And it seems like you're gesturing towards uh, critical removal, refusal, participation is not necessarily inherently good, kind of going back to these notions of have, what, what is a critical stance towards this kind of dominant multicultural anti-racist discourse look like? At least I want to turn it to you because I know you're taking lots of notes. And, and like I said, your, your phrase that you started with, the slowdown is the counterinsurgency, uh, still seems to resonate. Yeah, I'm, I'm always taking notes. Um, I have notebooks of notes. But um, I mean, a few things come to mind. I got a flash of an image um, at the beginning of the question and while Ernest was speaking. Do you all remember that image of, of Congress um, yeah. with the Kentikloth? Um, you know, Pelosi and Chucky e. Schumer. And it, and it goes back to like, where, well, where, why weren't you wearing that five, 10 years ago? Uh, you know, um, and, and I loved the responses on Black and Brown Twitter. Um, and then I came to, one thought of like, well, what does anti-racism look like? It, it, it's, it's just not a symbolic action, but it's actually doing the work, you know, and, and it's something that the People's Cultural Plan, which is a project that I, that was mentioned before that I'm one of the co-organizers of um, at the beginning of the pandemic on March 22nd, you know, we, we published what should art what should museums and cultural institutions be doing right now? You know, and, and one of the things that we mentioned was, you know, share your Wi-Fi, 
there are lots of people, you know, and schools that don't have that resource. Share your Wi-Fi. Um, you know, figure out how you can reuse your space, um, whether it's for food or testing or PPE. You know, reconfigure who's getting paid instead of like firing those at the lowest of the totem pole, you know, reconfigure your salaries, um, redistribute, um, put pressure on, on your representatives, on your board members who are, you know, far and large, a uh, part of, you know, the issues that we are um, facing, you know, that's how you start, not just talking the talk, but actually doing it, you know, museums, return the artifacts that were looted, just return them. You know, it's, it's funny, I look back on um, France, it's still in the middle of conversations with returning the artifacts to Benin. And my students and I, we talk about this. And, and the things that, you know, the audacity, the caucasity of, of colonial power um, to this day, you know, like France pulled up a law that hasn't been pulled out in like over 150 years to delay the return of the artifacts to Benin. Like it was some obscure thing. Um, you can't return something that was, in, that was passed down to you through inheritance. Like they're using that to stall the return, you know? So I think that's just one example. It's like return return, undo the wrongs. And, and it starts by just that, you know, um, providing the, the resources needed for those objects that aren't just artifacts, like artifacts in itself is a, is a colonial, colonized phrase, right? It's not something that we're researching, look at and, and poking holes at in a clinical way, but that's another panel. So, you know, and then provide the resources in which these, these objects can be repatriated. You know, it's just, that's where my thoughts are right now. And I don't wanna to take too much time up, um, but what, what anti-racism looks like. That's perfect. Luis, do you want to help yeah. us out? I have a, a couple of specific questions that we can turn to in the question of tangibly what is to be done in some, specific material practices. But Luis, what say you on what should yeah. anti-racism look like? Oof. Um, well, I follow uh, what the model of like what is my life and my scholarship and my artistic practice, which is carnival. And, and sort of like the clues that reside in carnival as, you know, because people think of uh, carnival as like people parading costumes. And then I, I like, like to remember people uh, the, to help people remember that uh, um, that before costumes were costumes they were uniforms and they were uniforms identifying gangs all over the caribbean in trinidad in colombia in venezuela in cuba in guadeloupe in haiti and these gangs were like rioting and rioting against a specific colonial and 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 laws that were like, slowing down the process of uh, the abolition of slavery. Uh, so like it's, it's that, that's sort of like the model and like that resonates with uh, what Ernest said about not anti-racism, anti but ante, anti-racism. Cause like then is again, this opportunity of slowing down for me is always like looking back as, as like, well, some of us in different ways and in different capacities and in different, different uh, levels of vulnerability We've been going through this like, like apocalyptic world for 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 a while. So like for me that resonates and that idea. Um, I think what Ernest said is like super beautiful about like why is it that my art have to change? And uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I heard poet and scholar and a dear friend of mine, Fred Moten, said like, look, like the people are asking me how is it that the pandemic changed my change my my work and it's like basically like fuck that if like you have to change if this condition needs to change your work your work is because you weren't doing the right work you know and i think that's incredibly it's, it's beautiful it's powerful and like it like help us to like um just can see that like 
I mean, there is this obsession in the U.S. with the new and latest and like that is like so tiring so much uh, and, and freeing in some other levels. And like in Latin America, there is obsessions with canons and like old things and like, but I think there is, a, there is something like an in-between uh, those two possibilities that is like, yeah, definitely. Like I, 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 I think I love to think of the parade because like that's where parades took form in the Caribbean. The, the appropriation, the co-opting of the European carnival tradition is like, we're gonna take up the streets and we're gonna make some noise and we're gonna make some people in their safe houses feel uncomfortable. And, 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 and that's powerful. And I think I, I like to think of like the parade and the march as, a, as an art form uh, and, 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 and also negate the condition of art form because like that's a reduction. Uh, it's not that like this needs to get need, need to be recognized as art because it is something greater. It is something bigger. And then one of the things that em that emerged is like I remember the chants at the beginning of the of the marches in late May, and Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. The and now if you go to a march, you're gonna see musical ensembles. And you're gonna see that like these chantings, they took on, a, they are taking in a completely new new level. So at the same time, I'm living in these times that feel like completely new. And at the same time, I feel sometimes that I'm in the midst of like emerging in a new emerging carnival, way more po political than the carnival that we have had in the Caribbean until now. And that maybe we're in that moment of like creativity and like retaking that. And because like the, the, the change in the, in the network, in the sort of like the support, the logistics in, 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 in marches, it's taking a level of complexity that is really beautiful. I mean, the chance, the Black Lives Matter chance is just turned into at least 25 different chants with music, with bands, with ensembles. Um, and, and, and I feel it's really beautiful. And, and I've also been thinking of like the difference with like 10 years ago, uh, Occupy Wall Street that it was like taking a space and holding it and try to defend it. And now it's just like the moving thing. And I feel that's like a clue. That's, that's, that's a clue for like, for like being able to move and not, I mean, be present if like that's what it feels that it is necessary in the moment. Or as Ernest was saying, not being present, negating, slowing down, uh, slowing down the process as Alicia was saying. Um, so, so I, I, I like to think of like my way of thinking and my way of like dealing with these things is like, it's always looking back at like what, a word that sounds like a cliche here for people that have no contact with them, like no, no WhatsApp group with their ancestors, but like, yeah, look back at like what their ancestors did and what they are telling us today. Oh, that's very nice, wonderful. Uh, we are coming to, We've touched on a number of important themes, um, but I want to be able to give the, the people who've sent in questions a chance to ask them. And it sounds like both these questions are coming from people who are close to the practices of art or artists themselves. Um, one, I'll, I'll put them both and whoever wants to say something about. One of them is in New York City with the layoffs and different organizations like museums and theaters and the budget cuts, what do you think, or can you speak about the inequalities and the no protections for artists in artistic work? So one is about the conditions of making art, a little bit to Alicia's point. A second one, what about the role of white artists? What should it be right now? How can a white artist participate and be an ally and create without speaking over artists of color? Should white artists be creating art about race? So two provocative questions. I don't know who wants to say something to. People are smiling, so that means you're going to say something. Um, can you first repeat the first question, just so I can make a note? Yes, the first question was about the inequalities and the no protections for artists in artistic work right now in the context of the layoffs and the budget cuts. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if I like really have an answer to that. I think, I mean, art making is art making is. Um, for so many people, like just a, you know, okay, I'm gonna have that precarious life. Um, 
And I think there's like professional artists and then they're artists um, like at the periphery and even like some designate, like a homeless or somebody whose work doesn't get seen, you know, just a, like a kind of figuratively homeless artist. And I think um, it's important to, um, this is something that I've always had to deal with. Um, not being like a quote unquote professional artist in, in that way. And when I say professional, I mean like um, participating in the market in a way that sustains my life, right? I think it's a, it's a opportunities to like do things like, you know, find other institutional support such as like teaching, you know, like I really in, enjoy teaching. I think it's a great opportunity to, to reproduce myself and reproduce my values in a different way, you know, and engage with students Criticize, criticizing my values and kind of trying to always constantly be engaged, you know? And I also think like there's so many examples of so many artists, like you think about Charles Bukowski, right? Um, Bukowski working in a mail room, you know? And at the same time, like writing all those poems and doing all that writing um, in the middle of the night. And then at one point, you know, um, being able to just continue to write or, um, Fanon doing kind of psychological work. And also, um, I mean, there's so many artists who do other things other than stay in the studio for eight hours a day. And, you know, every six months or for some people that I see um, every month or so, like have an exhibition here, like all around the world. And I just think like, that's a kind of professional representation as an artist. You know, I think it doesn't like, it's no consolation for like layoffs if you were working in a museum you know, or um, inequalities if you are still working and you um, don't get the pay that allows you to actually have a life, you know? And I think there are things like solidarity, people can work together, people can strike, you know? People can strike, people can, like, if, if the kind of collective of artists said, we are not going to do X, Y, and Z, then those things won't happen. You know, it's not like curators have more power than artists. You know, it's not like critics have more power than artists. Like they talk about the stuff that we make, right? They write about the stuff that we make, you know, theory, like for so many people follows like different phenomena that already exist in the world and then tries to make sense of it. So it's following something. And if that something is the artist and you are that person, then you have like the utmost power in the relationship. You can strike means I'm not gonna participate unless this, this and this happens. You know, and then there's strike breakers and, you know, line crosses and scabs, but that's another, another story. And I, I just think those are, that's one way um, to engage and to kind of be cognizant of, you know, other people, like as a professional artist, are there things that I would strike if I was that person? Are there things that I could strike for, for my colleagues that may not have that kind of um, professional standing that I have? You know, and I've spoken with other writers that I know that do this, you know, um, like by quoting each other, you know, and people do this when other folks are, you know, trying to get work done in academia. It's like, okay, I'm a new professor. I publish these papers that are kind of obscure and, you know, their, their colleague reads them. It's like, oh yeah, I'll quote that. You know, I think it's interesting, I'll quote it, you know. And it begins this other kind of unfolding and a creation of a discourse. And sometimes that can help. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it can. But that's just something that I um, have recently become aware of and trying to do a kind of cultural exchange, exchange with a friend of mine in Russia and trying to do the, just to create this bridge, you know, and it may be crap, but it's like, oh, well, yeah, let's do something. You know, I have resources here. You have resources there. Um, I'm currently under a fellowship now. So yeah, I can actually eat food in a way, in a different way. And so it's like, yeah, let's do something. You know, if we make a book, we could actually publish it, you know, independently publish it. And we don't have to go and ask for money for this or for that, which comes with its own terms. And to try to address like the other statement about like what quote unquote white artists should do. It's like, I don't know what you should do. You know, like, what do you think you should do? You know, it's like, I mean, I could say like, there's certain things that I could say, but man, eh, you know, maybe not, maybe it's better not to say that say that thing, you know, because then it just can become like a way for me to corrupt a person, you know, like I once saw this video and I can't remember the name of the um, teacher. It was a teacher and he was teaching a group of students and they all got to ask him a question. And 
um, he's kind of like a sage. And one student says, yeah, uh, um, so-and-so, I, you know, I have a problem. And he said, well, what is your problem? Sit down and tell me. And he says, well, how do I, um, how do I not be proud? I don't want to have so much pride when I deal with people because, you know, too much pride is not a good thing. And then he sat down and he said, hmm, this is an interesting question, right? It's interesting that you asked me this question because you know what it is that you need to do. But you asked me because you want me to pervert you and get you to do something else. So you don't have to actually confront what it is that you already know, you know? And I think that's one of the best kind of like examples. It's not my example, but it's something that I've seen that I think like, okay, sometimes I do know the answer to my question. And sometimes asking a person what I should do is just a desire to be perverted away from seeking the truth that I already know. It's like right around the corner. And I just need that one person to tell me like, ah, you don't really need to do that, you know, and give me some reason. And I can say, well, yeah, so-and-so, you know, so-and-so told me that I don't need to participate in that. And they had a convincing reason. And so now I can, you know, I can foreclose that particular gesture. So I don't really have, you know, I don't want to give a direct response because I think about it. I think about certain questions as those type of like personal kind of existential questions that the person has to work out for themselves. And particularly in relationship to art, it's like, if you ask me what, what you should make, I'm going to have you you know, you don't want to be in that situation. You don't want to say, what should I do with my, with my life? What should, what should, in this sense, like with the art, what should I do? Should I make this thing? It's like, you have to think about that. You know, you have to think, should you do it or should you not? You know, and really sit and mull it over and think about your position in the world and what's happening in the world. And, you know, how, what's your relationship to that? And what's your relationship to producing art? And then look at, okay, what have other people done in history? And that who have a similar position to yourself, you know, what have they done? What have people done that so many folks say is great? And what have people done that so many folks say is crap? And why do they say it's crap? And why do they say this other thing is great? And then, okay, well, where do I want to be? You know, where do I want to be? Where do I want to go? You know, there are like so many different biographies and memoirs at the present. It's like, okay, you just like pick one and like look at it and be like, okay, I think that's cool. I like that person. People respect that person for these reasons. They got some pretty good morals and a pretty good way of being in the world. They seem to have like an authentic type of experience and been after pursuing something. I'm like, let me try to do that, you know? And sooner or later you on that path, just diverge and like find your own thing. And that's the, the kind of answering of that question. It's just kind of like, oh, go do it. You know, find out for yourself. I'm not gonna like, uh -uh. Very nice, Alicia and then Luis. Do you have thoughts on either of these questions? Um, I, I have a few, a, a couple of thoughts on, um, you know, artists. And I, I think that on the first question, to be specific, um, I think that, yes, art making happens. It continues. Art making for artists continues. You're still going to be making art. Um, I think that how can we lessen the hustle, right? I think that perhaps it starts with um, aligning ourselves with workers um, and understanding that there, I mean, there are class issues and educational privileges um, that are inherent um, when you become an artist and how you become an artist, right? If you go through the academia route um, as opposed to self-taught artists, right? So, um, and I think that it, it starts with and this is going back to the people's cultural plan and why we came together is, is for many things is that we're workers first, right? We're tenants first, um, aligning ourselves with, with, with workers. So what's important for workers, what's important to the majority of people who are on the brink of getting evicted from their apartments, right? It's like, stop, stop the rent. We're, stop, stop the rent, just freeze it, right? Um, I couldn't help but just another flash image, that article, Amazon, Google, Facebook, they're buying up all these office spaces um, while small businesses, like tiny businesses, we're not talking about chain stores, right? small little businesses are struggling to survive, right? Um, because why? The, the landlords have not stopped the rent, right? People are on the verge of losing their apartments because the rents have not decreased, they continue. 
credit checks, credit report, all that continues to alienate and to prevent people from living. So how do we um, remain living as artists is make, making sure that other, that workers are able to, to be in this city without having to sacrifice 90% of their income to paying the rent. And that's just a start, that's an example, right? Um, I think that once we start having that conversation and, and uh, again, putting, putting action and work behind it, I think that you know, the survival of arts and art making will, be, will, will, will start becoming a pivotal, important question, right? Um, and, and I have nothing to add to the second question that Ernest has not covered. Luis. <clears throat> Yes, yeah, so uh, I think uh, Ernest said, said it all about the second question, but the, the, the first question, um, I think that, uh, so that like the, 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 the commonality of, of our visions, I, I feel here of art and activism is that they both require a coming together. And that coming together might mean different things for different people. Um, and I think we, we hear, we, we heard like a, a critical and alternative and creative ways of like coming together. But, but, but I would say that like one of the things is like, in, in, and I tell people of, you know, carnival traditions in the Caribbean have been existing for around 300, 400 years. And for most of the time, there was no funding for that. For most now there is funding and like commercialization for some things, but like there was no funding. So and that allows to see in carnival, carnival crews, escuelas de escuelas de samba, eh, comparsas, cumbiambas, like all these forms of collectivities that make carnival. There's no funding. There are we can we can mention a few big, big, huge names, Claudia Jones, for example, the great Marxist and Carnival maker in London, but there are just a few names of people that, 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 that are, you know, like individual artists in, in, in Carnival, but like there is like 300 years of like endless creativity and coming together and people realizing that so that things can happen so that a costume can be made so that like people need to eat, that people need to be together, that need, people need to be happy. And Carnival, you know, for those that have been close to that tradition, it's emerging not from people that are content and happy and like, no, there is hunger, there is lack, there is necessity, there is poverty, there is, and despite all that, like, like we keep coming together. And, and, I, and I feel that's what, what, what I think is, 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 is the potential that remains, even if the coming together is digital or is through mail or is in presence or is like, that we, we need to keep finding moments of coming together and that coming together is like the precondition the ante so that like we can face racism so that we can face uh artistic creativity so that like we can organize and protect our communities and 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 what i think is has changed what the pandemic the shift for me has been that that i'm even now i'm i'm, I'm putting more and more energy and focus and and attention to the coming together and then just relaxing about the other things you know just like letting let, letting it go and, and and trusting what is it that can happen that's that's in my case but but the, the coming together as a, as a precondition for all the rest very nice and uh, thank you luis and uh, i'm getting uh, strong signals that we're coming to time but ernest wanted to have a uh, one additional thing that he wanted to say. Um, I, I also should say, um, like this formulation of anti anti like I first heard that from Fred Moten. So I should say, I, you know, in, in speaking about anti normativity and um, instead of being in conversation with the normative and trying to push against that, he speaks about a condition that exists prior to normativity. And normativity is actually a response to this other kind of. Um, chaos and like moving in flux, which is generative. Um, but the thing I, I wanted to like say, like regarding artists, like always remembering what that thing is, like the creation of images and objects, what that thing is. 
And it reminds me of this um, quote by Amiri Baraka, who in a lecture, I, for, I forget where, um, he quotes uh, Mao and he quotes Mao from a lecture that he gave um, on actually art and um, literature. And he says like Marx said, or not Marx, uh, Mao says, um, all, um, all propaganda is art, but not all art is propaganda, but not all propaganda is art, right? And then he continues and he says like, when you paint a flower, um, that's your propaganda about that flower, right? And then he, he continues even more and he says like, you know, it's just, this is so important. He says in a world, it's, it's about like um, grabbing for um, truth and beauty, you know? And I think this is like interesting. It doesn't become like this, oh yeah. Yeah, because he continues and he says like, yeah, you know, in a world of lies, you know, rampant lies, like bring up truth and present truth and then see what happens, you know? And, you know, bring up in a world of ugliness, like bring up beauty and say that I want beauty and then like, see what happens, you know? And he goes on to talk about like, so what the artist's role is, is like unrelenting war against evil. And I think some of those types of statements, I think like really resonated with me. And I saw those things years ago because it's like a part of a particular tradition and way of navigating in the world that so many artists participate in, but exactly what that is, isn't he doesn't disclose what it is exactly, but he does say like, okay, this, these are ways of being and here's the context here's the context of the world and do this. And then you see what happens, you know, just do it. So that's what I just wanted to share that. Very nice. That, that's a wonderful closing statement for the discussion tonight. I feel like we could go another two hours, <laughs> but speaking of slowing down and Zoom fatigue, but I really wanted to appreciate just the thoughtful and sharp engagement you brought to this conversation and pushing against these questions. You know, these are such vital issues. Uh, I, I look forward to being in conversation with you uh, down the line with these, but thank you so much. Yes, thank you all so much. And um, the only thing very quickly that I want to add to the second question um, is that I think white allies of all types, artists, activists, academics, neighbors, partners, friends, can be opening up spaces for the work and the voices of our POC friends um, and be a little bit less worried about how we are perceived in our own art or work right now. I think actually that's something that I feel deeply. So I wanted to add that. Um, and I want to thank all of you so much uh, for this intimate and honest um, and rich conversation. I also feel the Zoom fatigue, but I felt like we were all in a living room with a beautiful uh, illustrator there performing for us. So thank you so much. And um, the next uh, shift event will be on food where we will touch more on mutual aid that will be announced soon. Um, please everyone stay safe, vote, have a nice weekend and tune into the next